So first of all, I'm just going to start with a bit of background about solar sailing, um, and what it is and how it works. And then I'm going to focus on CubeSail, which is the University of Surrey, the Surrey Space Center's uh, solar sailing satellite mission. Um, and then focus a bit on the implementation details and exactly what we're trying to achieve there. So first of all, solar sailing. What is it? Um, solar sailing or solar force is really just momentum exchange with photons from the sun. So it's using sunlight for propulsion. Now, um, what happens when a photon hits the surface, um, a couple of things can happen. Either there's reflection uh, or there's absorption. Uh, and if reflection happens, you can either have a mirror-like reflection where the uh, photon just bounces off the surface normal with exactly the same um, incident angle, uh, the exit angle is the same then, or diffuse reflection where the photon gets scattered in a, in a random direction. Uh, and actually, this is where the animation comes in. So that just demonstrates um, sp specular reflection or mirror reflection. Um, and then this demonstrates photon absorption. Now, the point I'm trying to make with these animations is with photon absorption, uh, the the resultant force vector is going to be in the same direction as your incident sunlight. But with uh, mirror-like reflection, the direction of the force is uh, along the same line as your surface normal. Now, ideally for a solar sail, uh, we want mirror-like re reflection. The reason for that is um, the force is greater. And also, um, you don't want to absorb photons because that really implies that your cell is going to heat up. You're just going to heat up the, um, the material. Um, but because this is a real world, we can't have perfect uh, mirror-like reflection, uh, but we try and make the cell as much as a mirror as possible. Uh, but still, because of the small component of absorption that you're still going to get, the resultant solar force is somewhere in between the cell normal vector and the uh, direction of the incident sunlight. Now, in that picture, or in this animation, I had um, a photon hitting a sail. Um, and I, I mean, in the animation, yeah, it's easy. You could just you know, make it move. But you can imagine a single photon hitting something. I mean, we're bombarded by photons all the time, and it's not really like you feel any effect. So the point I'm making is um, solar force is small. Um, in terms of numbers, 4.56 times 10 to the minus 6 newton per square meter. So to make this useful as a form of propulsion, we need a very big area, a very big surface for the sunlight to hit. And that's where the challenge comes in with, with solar sailing. Now, there's two sort of design uh, philosophies with solar sails. The one is to have the sail um, not supported by a structure, and the other one is to have it supported by a structure. So almost seems illogical not to support the cell with the structure, but it's actually quite feasible, as the Japanese have recently demonstrated with their Icarus mission. I don't know I mean, if you're up to date with that. But the idea there is to spin uh, the satellite and to use this constant spinning motion both for the deployment of the cell, uh, this centripetal force, both for the deployment of the cell and to keep the cell taut. Um, and then the other philosophy would be to have a rigid structure that deploys and that keeps the cell taut. And both of these philosophies have got their own merits and their own uh, complications. So for instance, with a rigid sail, uh, rigidly supported sail, you have more mass because your support structure uh, obviously takes up more mass. Uh, but then again, controlling the attitude of a spinning sail is, is a bit more cumbersome. And you also have to ensure that you have this constant spinning motion. Solar sails aren't really useful for everyday propulsion in low Earth orbit, like you would have um, orbit maintenance. Um, but they are good for um, science fiction type missions. Um, I don't say science fiction, but I mean just the fact that the Jap Japanese have now launched a satellite that's going all the way to Venus tells you it's not really that much of science fiction anymore. Um, so solar cells would be good for interplanetary missions, um, science missions to other planets. Um, NASA is planning to use solar cells for uh, interstellar, interstellar precursor missions. Uh, it's also good for rendezvous missions to um, comets, uh, other foreign objects. 
um, and a bunch of other non-kip layer and orbits like um, solar polar imaging, um, monitoring the Earth, Earth's geomagnetic field and so forth. But as I said, in low Earth orbit, they don't really have that much of a use, uh, especially if you go at lower altitudes, because lower altitudes, there is still a very thin layer of Earth atmosphere. Um, and if you've got a very big surface area, then you generate a whole lot of aerodynamic drag. Um, but I'll get to that in a couple of slides later also. The, the material that we use for this, as I said, we want uh, ideally a perfect mirror, but also we want it to be very light. Um, obviously, you can generate a big force, but the heavier your satellite is, the less it's going to actually move because of this for force. So we want cell material that is very light, um, but at the same time, it should be able to tolerate the conditions uh, that it will experience in space, and that is the exposure to the UV light um, and tolerance uh, to extreme temperatures. Um, now, there's a bunch of other um, more experimental materials also, but I'm just going to focus on uh, the stuff that's sort of more mainstream. Um, and usually cell material consists of some substrate with a reflective layer deposited on that. Um, and the substrate materials that have been used in the past is mylar, uh, kapton, um, and something called CP1, which is being developed by Mantec in the US. Um, uh, and CP1 uh, has got very good um, UV resistance properties and thermal properties. Um, mylar, on the other hand, um, although it's actually been used in space, um, they actually call um, mylar with aluminum on top of it, they call it space blanket, and you can buy it now from most camping stores. They also call it emergency thermal blanket. Um, um, but mylar is okay for short duration missions, but it's not so good uh, under UV light uh, because it degrades uh, fairly fast. Uh, in terms of thickness of the material, um, it can be anything as low as submicron um, thickness to tens of, of micrometers. Uh, but the thinner the membrane goes, uh, there's a need for additional uh, structural support, and usually they use fibers uh, like Kevlar uh, to, to give that extra support. And the reflective layer is usually just aluminum that's deposited, on deposited onto the substrate because re uh, aluminum's got very good reflectivity. Um, but as I said, because of this imperfect, um, because you get like 0.1 absorption of photons still, that means there is still some <coughs> heating up of, of the cell, and if th that becomes an issue, um, then usually the backside of the cell is coated with a high emissivity material, something that will radiate the heat um, away from the, from the cell. Now, the reason I put this slide in here, um, attitude control, for those who don't know, is just controlling the orientation of the satellite. In other words, how is it pointing relative to some inertial frame? Uh, for solar cells, uh, that's important because the orientation of the cell determines the force, the direction of the force vector, the direction in which you're thrusting. Um, satellite um, attitude control, traditional methods of controlling satellite attitude are not always as convenient for solar cells because of this very large cell, you get large moments of inertia. And traditional actuators um, don't always cope that well if you, or I mean, to get the same effect, you would need very large actuator, actuators, like a very large reaction wheel, to get the same motion you would have had with a smaller satellite. So some smart people came up with um, other ideas of actually using the solar force itself as a means to control the attitude. And there are a, a few different ways of doing this. Um, the Icarus mission, for instance, changes the reflection of some parts of the cell to make it less um, specularly reflective. That means you get more force on one side of the cell than the other, so you get a, a slight rotation. Uh, another way of doing it would be to have uh, tiltable veins um, that would also give you a um, different thrust vector. But the method that, that, we're going to f that I'm going to focus on in this talk, because that's what we use for CubeCell, is to change the mass configuration of the satellite. Specifically, to change the vector between the center of mass and the center of pressure. Now, the center of mass is essentially the point around which the satellite will rotate if there's some disturbance uh, torque. Uh, whereas the center of the pressure is um, essentially the, the effective point where the solar force uh, works on the cell. So if the cell is perfectly symmetric, the center of pressure will be exactly in the middle of the cell. Now, I've got another anim animation to, uh, to demonstrate what I mean by this. In the 
in the initial situation where um, the center of mass is aligned with the, the solar force, uh, or, or sorry, the center of mass center of pressure vector is aligned with the solar force, um, the whole system is stable. But as soon as we start throwing our mass around with respect to the center of, um, center of pressure, uh, we create, uh, or there's going to be a control torque that will try to align this vector again with our solar force. And this is a mechanism that we're going to exploit to do attitude control with, with CubeCell. Um, that's everything, uh, background for solar sailing. Uh, but I also have a slight bit of additional background on aerodynamic drag deorbiting. Um, the reason why I put that in, um, okay, first of all, let me explain what I mean by deorbiting. Uh, so I'm just going to read exactly what it says here. It's accelerating the decay in orbital altitude so that you can remove non-operational payloads or satellites that have come to at the end of their lifetime. But it could also be to, um, it doesn't necessarily have to mean orbital decay, it could just be removing the satellite to uh, some graveyard orbit where it no longer can interfere with anything else. Um, and the reason why we want to do this, um, lately there's this whole issue of orbital debris, and I've, I mean, some of you may have seen pictures and exaggerated pictures of all of the actual things floating around in low Earth orbit, and it's quite shocking actually how much um, non-useful things there are uh, in low Earth orbit. So there's, a, there's this drive going on to clean up the, the space in low Earth orbit and in geo, around geo, um, because there's always the threat of collisions uh, and the more things we launch, the more um, imminent this th threat becomes. So we want to purposefully deorbit satellites um, and other pieces of debris um, to address this problem of uh, um, ongoing orbital debris. Now, what does this have to do with solar cells? Um, we want to also show in our project that we can use our solar cell as uh, a means of deorbiting. Now. There's two ways that you can actually do this. One would do this. The one way would be to use the actual solar force um, as a means of lower, lowering your orbit. Uh, but the other way is also to use it in low Earth orbit specifically as a big parachute. In other words, where previously for a, for a solar force demonstration mission, the drag would be a disturbance. Now you can use it to your advantage by making, uh, <coughs> making a satellite a big parachute. Uh, in terms of uh, four sizes, um, I have this very simple graph that just uses the exponential model for the Earth atmosphere. And you can see for um, altitudes below about 700 kilometers, the uh, aerodynamic drag force will always dominate. So for a mission that wants to demonstrate solar, solar force propulsion, we have to ideally be higher than 700 kilometers. And then the effect of adding a parachute to a satellite, uh, specifically a th three kilogram nano satellite, uh, is demonstrated in this graph. Um, you'll see the bottom axis is exponential, otherwise everything um, on the left would just be a simple straight line down. But you'll see without um, a significant surface area, the, the orbital life, the satellite lifetime for, for the small satellite is in the order of hundred, tens and hundreds of years. Um, but as soon as you add uh, this is a 25 meter squared cell. Um, as soon as you add uh, a cell to do deorbiting with, then the lifetime drops to below one year, which is quite significant. And this brings me to cube cell specifically. Um, and these four bullets are what we are trying to achieve with our mission. So first of all, we want to show that you can deploy uh, a structure capable of supporting a, uh, the sail uh, in space. Then we want to show that it's possible to do propulsion with using solar force. Um, and we also want to utilize the center of mass, center of pressure offset uh, to do attitude control with. And then lastly, we want to show that it's possible to use the same sail uh, as a drag deorbiting device. The people working on this, um, you've heard Dr. Vias Lapis mentioned before, um, this is what he looks like, um, if you haven't met him. Um, so he's got quite a few things going on, um, propulsion, solar sailing and so on. Um, 
So because he's a busy man, he got me to do um, system engineering and project management uh, just on this project. Uh, and then we have four PhD students working uh, on this as well. Now, for the solar force propulsion bit of the mission, um, the sort of the mission timeline is for, uh, after launch for one year to demonstrate solar force propulsion, uh, and thereafter to demonstrate uh, satellite deorbiting. Obviously, we can't do it the other way around because that's not good. Um, yeah, I think it just restarts again. Uh, obviously, you can't do the orbiting first and then uh, demonstrate solar force uh, because, I mean. <laughs> just start from the right slide. Yeah. Um, so for the first year, we want to demonstrate solar force propulsion. Um, and as I said before, um, I lied a little bit because I said you can't really demonstrate solar force propulsion effectively at low Earth orbits. And this is exactly what we're going to do because that's really sort of the lowest cost option and the only feasible option for us. Uh, it's not like we have a budget of billions of, of dollars and pounds. Um, but because ours is a demonstration mission, um, it's not like we want to go to Mars or anything. We found a different way of demonstrating the effect of solar force other than by uh, changing the orbit altitude. In other words, uh, not going further away from the Earth, we find, found a way of changing uh, one of the other orbital parameters, namely the orbital inclination. Now, how this works is um, we plan to launch the satellite in a sun-synchronous initial orbit. And that means uh, well, I'm sure most of you are aware of um, the different orbits, but this just means that um, the, the plane in which the satellite is orbiting is going to always have the same angle with respect to the sun. So if the satellite is going over the equator um, how many times a day, the local time beneath the satellite will always be the same. So if it's, for instance, at a 12 o'clock zero hour orbit, um, every time the satellite goes over uh, the equator, it's always going to be at 12 o'clock. Hours. Um, I've got an animation that, that actually explains this also a bit better. Um, the reason, well, one of the reasons for choosing this is because it's popular, popular low Earth orbit altitude, especially for imaging missions. So that means we'll be able to um, make, uh, take uh, advantage of, of different piggyback launch opportunities. Um, because we still want to demonstrate solar force and we don't want this to come down because of drag initially, uh, we still need an al altitude of above 700, so ideally about 750 kilometers. Uh, with the initial sun angle of 45 degrees, uh, that will ensure that we've got uh, a portion daylight and a portion eclipse. And this demonstration relies on, on this, um, the fact that we have a portion daylight and a portion eclipse. Because that means for a part of the orbit, the sun, sunlight propulsion is going to have an effect. And for the other part of the orbit, there's going to be no, no force. And this will generate a torque uh, on our orbit, which will eventually lead to a change in orbital inclination. I think this is the... Yeah, happens to work now. So I don't know if you can really see, but... Um, this is just now accelerated uh, so that you can see the effect over one year. Um, so the sun synchronous orbit um, follows the, the sun in its motion over one year. But at the same time, we are changing our, our inclination. So our, so our orbit was initially sun, sun synchronous, but because we're changing the inclination, the sun synchronously drifts a bit. So that at the end of one year, uh, the orbit has changed to face the um, to face the sun. And to show this graphical change that we expect, um, if we did not have any solar force, then this is the trend that you can expect. Whereas, because of the fact that we're going to have this um, constant torque on our orbit, uh, we get a change in inclination of about 1.7 degrees per year. Uh, it doesn't sound like much. But 
this is something that will definitely be observable because um, for any Keplerian orbit, uh, sorry, not even Keplerian, for any regular orbit where you don't have significant solar force, you will have constant inclination. Um, so that's the everything of how, uh, sorry, everything about what we want to achieve, um, and now for the how we are going to achieve it. Um, we're going to use a CubeSat, um, which is by far the the volume uh, requirement of the CubeSat is by far the most um, limiting factor or the most challenging factor in this project. Um, we're aiming for a five by five meter squared sail, uh, five by five square uh, shaped sail. Um, uh, four booms supporting the sail, and we have uh, four triangular sections of sail. Uh, each boom is 3.5 meter, uh, meters long. A few graphical depictions of what it will look like. Uh, in terms of the attitude control for the sail, um, we've got a few traditional sensors like a sun and an ADR optical sensor, just CMOS cameras um, pointing towards the earth and towards the sun that, uh, that calculates the center vectors of those two objects. A magnetometer and a a gyroscope aligned with the satellite body y-axis. Uh, and then for actors we, actuators, we've got uh, traditional torque rods, but then also this novel um, two-axis translation stage, which will give us this controlled offset between the center of mass and center of pressure that we've talked about. And fitting all of this into, as I said, fitting the, all of this into the CubeSat is going to be tricky. Um, and this is how we plan to do it. Um, we've got a 1U CubeSat uh, bus with all the electronic components, that's power and communication, ADCS and so on. Um, and then a translation stage in between that and the sail. Um, and in the stowed configuration we have a roughly 2U size volume, uh, that's 10 by 10 by 24 about, um, for the sail and the booms and everything. Uh, in terms of mass, um, we want, we're still aiming to go uh, to get the mass as low as possible because obviously the lower the mass, the bigger effect you will see of, of the solar fo force. Uh, and this stage, our mass budget is about just below three kilograms. Okay, at this point we delve into the, the detailed bits of the implementation. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on everything, so um, later on you can ask me you know, questions about stuff that I might, may have missed. But the essentials of the deployment uh, is that we want to use self-straightening uh, structures like tape measures um, for the booms and then this will automatically un uh, unfold and unfold the, the cell. Now when you look at the, the different options to manufacture these booms, this, it, it becomes evident that the properties of the material that you choose uh, also di dictates the rest of the deployment, how it's going to happen over time and what sort of mechanism you need uh, to constrain it and to make it happen in a coherent way. So we've identified two uh, possible materials or two feasible materials, uh, but along with that goes two separate deployment concepts. Uh, and at this point we haven't actually decided on a specific one yet, so we're investigating both of them to see um, where that takes us. The one option would be to use metal strips similar to a tape measure, uh, but in this case we make them from copper beryllium, uh, which has been used before in space for deployable antennas and so on. Uh, the properties of, of this is um, you can make these from relatively thin strips of metal. Um, and then the, well, thinking back to when I was, when I was very young and still because I'm you know, engineer, uh, I guess from that point on, uh, it was evident because I opened up all of my toys and stuff to see how they work inside. And there's always that one toy, that wind-up toy that when you loosen that last screw that keeps everything together, everything just pops out and you have springs everywhere and, and so on. Um, now with these uh, copper beryllium strips, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. As soon as you take it out of the housing, it's going to, every, the force that wants to straighten the structure is present um, along the length of the of the boom, um, and that's something that you have to take in, into consideration when you uh, want to use this for deployment. Um, 
the, on the other side of the spectrum, we've, um, we've found a manufacturer here, the, here in the UK um, that makes a product called Bistable Reeled Composites. Um, now, where the metal tape measures want to uncoil by themselves, the big difference is um, the composite or the specific BRC booms are stable in both the coil and the uncoiled configuration. In other words, if you were to have a coil like this, uh, I could put it on the table and it won't unroll by itself. Um, and also if you uh, straighten it, then also it's stable in that configuration. Um, but as soon as you flip from the coiled configuration, as soon as you flip up one of the one of the edges, um, then the force that causes the thi this thing to self-straighten is only present at that transition between the um, between the two forms. In other words, it's only present at at this bending point. So the two different deployment mechanisms uh, we have then for the metal booms, we have uh, we have these support structures moving out of openings out of housing and for the composites we have them unfurling like blades of a windmill. Uh, and I've got animations or videos to show you uh, a bit better. Before I get to that, uh, I just want to make in the point that we are seriously limited in volume even more clear. Um, this is just a graph to show you um, that the thickness, it's fairly obvious actually, um, we want to coil four of these booms around the same spindle. Um, we have to do that. I mean, you could also reason that it's possible to have multiple coils um, stacked on top of each other. Uh, but the thing is our volume doesn't allow us to go too high because there still has to be room for the sail to be packed in. So to make everything fit, uh, we need to coil four of these booms around the same spindle or around the same axis. And the thicker the cross-section of, of each boom, the thicker the total coil is going to become. And that's just what this graph is trying to show. Um, if we're aiming for a total coil, coil diameter of 10, 10 centimeters, which is as much as we can possibly uh, fit into the CubeSat footprint, then it leaves us with a boom uh, cross-section thickness of 0 0.5 millimeters, which is not a lot. Um, and then in the previous slide I mentioned uh, open section and closed section and what I mean by that is um, this is a cross section for a, a typical tape measure um, but it's possible to make structures that have got um, whether the radius uh, of your cross, cross section or the angle, sorry, the angle of this cross section uh, is more closed um, so that it becomes like this. But in this case the um, the coiled uh, strip is going to be a lot higher, uh, as you can imagine, because it's this um, circumference that, that in the end determines the, the height of this coil. Um, and because we can't go too high in this, as I mentioned, because we still have to fit a sail into the, the extra volume, another option would be to go for something like that lenticular shape where we have two booms uh, together and then uh, compressed and we then coil that around the spindle. But that gives us extra thickness again. So these are the, the different options of the trade-offs. Trade um, focusing on the copper beryllium concept, um, as I said, this we to get the required stiffness property um, uh, from these booms, we have to go, we need a closed section. Uh, these booms aren't strong enough so that you can just have an open section. But because of our volume doesn't allow us to do this, we have to go for something like this, or in the alternative, this Y-shaped uh, profile, which is actually similar to, uh, or oh, that's actually a picture of the Nano CLD NASA booms. Uh, the deployment mechanism would have uh, rollers to guide out the booms, uh, and then additional rollers to keep everything nice and contained inside the uh, inside the volume. Um, in this deployment mechanism, we can only attach the sail to the tips of the boom, and then obviously to the base. So there's only per sail segment there's only three attachments. Uh, this is a video of 
uh, one of the deployment tests. This is with a 1.7 by 1.7 by scale model. And you'll see it happens fairly rapidly because of the, the force stored in this coil. And then our second concept, the bistable reeled composites one, um, slightly different because of the fact that it unfurls and it doesn't shoot out of openings. Um, these booms, well, the manufacturing of these booms are somewhat, um, I don't have all of the knowledge because our structures guy is um, mainly in charge of this, but I know the basics and I know that it consists of some substrate with fibers embedded in it. Um, and what gives it this uh, biostable property is the, um, the cross-section um, or the, this cross-hatching pattern of these fibers. Um, and it's then placed around a forming tube and then um, left to cure. Uh, once again, we have a central hub with, where all three booms are, are connected and then they're cooled around each other. Uh, and then there's this spacer plate that just ensures that all of um, that each boom has its own uh, quadrant to deploy and so as not to interfere with, with the rest. Uh, the sail attachment for this concept, we can actually use the entire length of the boom to attach the sail. And this g gives us the um, advantage of distributing the load uh, that the sail is going to have uh, over the, the entire boom length. And that means we don't have to go for a closed section boom. You can actually have an open section boom, which is good in terms of volume. And just another video showing a deployment for this. Uh, one thing to note here is I said the booms um, are unfurling, um, but this would actually be the satellite bus, so it's just relative. I mean, if the cells are just expanding, it means the bus is going to rotate. It's just the same same thing, really. Uh, and that's it for the deployment um, subsystem, which brings me to the ADCS subsystem, and here I'm just going to quickly skim over things. Um, because for the bus components, we're going to mostly use commercial um, COTS components. Um, there's no need for us to develop our own power system. But when it comes to ADCS, there's still a need for some custom um, hardware. Um, so specifically, we have a bunch of PC 104 PCBs, which is the standard CubeSat um, sized PCB. We have a sun and nadir sensor, um, and a magnetic and translation interface unit, and then an attitude control processor, which is also um, actually a, cu a custom module. The sensor module and magnetic and translation interface unit are actually um, being developed at the University of Stellenbosch by PhD students over there, or master's uh, degree students. Um, and then just the function of each, the attitude control, control processor is just our processor that ex executes all of these attitude control algorithms. The Sun and Nadir sensor, as I said, um, uses two CMOS cameras. The one's pointed towards the um, towards the Earth in the nominal fly direction, and the other one uh, faces the, the direction of the sun. They've got very wi very vi very wide field of view um, lenses um, to give them a very w uh, big operating uh, range. The processing module performs the image processing for this. It just um, extracts the center of the illuminated disk on each image and uh, gives you a center location for that. That translates into uh, a sun vector and a nadir vector. Then the magnetic and translation interface unit is just an interface to the two actuators, in other words, an interface to the torque rods and the interface to the stepper motors uh, for the um, translation unit. Uh, and it also houses a mag the magnetometer and the uh, gyroscope. Torque rods are just traditional torque rods, um, electromagnets, um, which you can switch off with switch on and off with a certain polarity. Um, uh, and we use pulse width modulation to control the, the actual amount of torque that we generate. Uh, and then the translation unit, which is the, the interesting bit really, um, consists of uh, two layers um, that are moved about by stepper motors uh, uh, that are sliding on linear rails. Uh, 
bit of video to show that working also. And then the rest of the bus subsystems, as I said, is just going to be uh, COTS components. Um, some of these we already have, some of them we still uh, have to procure. Um, but nothing exciting there. Um, in terms of the future of our project, we aim for um, to have an engineering model ready at the end of this year. Uh, that's also when our CDR is. Uh, and then end of uh, next year is uh, when we should be ready for launch. That's everything for CubeSail. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lawrence. I wonder if anybody has any, any questions on uh, the CubeSail project at all. Go ahead. Hi. Um, you said that you are, you, are, you are planning to use the sails also to reduce the time of the satellite will stay on orbit. You said it will go down and uh, de-orbit, actually. Will it also uh, shorten the, uh, the probability to, for the satellite to burn in the atmosphere because it, it has so much drag? kind of uh, parachute that will prevent it from burning? I don't see that happening because the sail is so thin. Um, I think, uh, and I think it will heat up so quickly. Um, I have to admit, this isn't an analysis that we've carried out yet. Um, but I can see the sail burning up so quickly. Uh, and then all that's left is just the structure uh, and this cube, which is, yeah. Um, I don't think it, it should be an issue yet. Any other questions? Gentlemen at the back of the, uh, the charging on the sail. Uh, electromagnetic uh, charging. Yeah. Um, the briefly, yes. Um, we've investigated that uh, actually as another means of um, uh, of deorbiting. Actually, um, there's a uh, um, study or a, a person that's uh, that's done an uh, investigation into what he calls. Uh, electromagnetic cell, which is not really a cell at all, but uh, it uses tethers um, uh, to form almost like a virtual cell, um, and it uses this as a means of deorbiting. Um, so we've got an idea of sort of the charge that will be generated by the cell, but we haven't actually looked at methods to get rid of the charge or what that's going to do at our, to our electronics now. Any more questions for Lawrence? Such a, such a small change one and a half uh, degrees over over a year uh, are are you going to be using uh, GPS time clocks or what are you going to use to 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 actually show that small a change yeah the I mean I've had this question before also the uh, I mean the ideal way to prove this would be to launch two exact satellites at the same time and one deploys the cell and one doesn't um, and you would then see the effect uh, the best um, I don't see that happening because no one's going to give us two launch opportunities and we're still hoping for, for just the one. Um, so yeah, the, the one option would be to include a GPS on board. Uh, the other option would be to rely on orbit models uh, to tell you what the, cell, what the satellite was supposed to be doing and measurements to tell you what it is doing. That's what we have to verify. Uh, yeah. Any more? It's a uh, gentleman towards the back there. When you're actually packing the sail and the booms into the two U, what's the sort of ratio between the two? Is one or the other booms the limiting factor, or the amount of sail material you can put in? Um, the what, the booms c uh, go into a smaller volume. Um, the sail we still have to because we don't have our eventual sail material or final sail material yet. We're, st we're still using space blanket to experiment with, and that's a lot thicker than um, than the final material will be. So we're trying to maximize the volume that we can have for the cell. Um, uh, presently, our booms go into a volume about 10 by 10 by 8 centimeters with the mechanism and everything included. And that leaves you with about uh, 12, 16 centimeters, 10 by 10 by 16 for the cell. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Thank you. Hopefully I got your name right this time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.